Good morning, second service. So glad that you're here this morning, and it's a great time uh, to be a part of Oakwood as we are a church that is growing to know, love, and live Jesus. And we do that by studying the Bible a lot. So if you have yours this morning, I invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Now, as always, you are welcome to use your phone, your iPad, your tablet. Just download the Oakwood app, go to sermon notes and all the scriptures and everything. We'll be there for you. We want you to engage the word of God today. As we've been in Daniel for a while and studying how do we stand up in a bowed down world. And we're going to just continue in that today here in Daniel chapter 5 and part 5 of our series. Now, I have to lay some background this morning for you to understand chapter 5 and all of its richness and all of its fullness. And so I'm going to start today by giving you just a little bit of background on what's going on. Now, do you remember back to Daniel chapter 1, how old was Daniel when we started reading this book? Do you remember? Teenager, right? So most scholars believe 14, 15 years old when they were brought from Jerusalem in exile over to Babylon. He was uh, converted into being part of the king's court and, and, and all that went along with that. So now when you get to chapter 5, you have to hit the fast forward button about 50 or 60 years. So Daniel is now pushing 70 years old. Anyone in here pushing 70? Raise your hand. Anybody feel like you're pushing 70? Raise your hand. Good. You guys are way more honest than first serve. First service had zero 70-year-olds. Zero. And I told them to repent, and they, they did. Had a lot come forward at the end of the service there. But, uh, yeah, and so you hit the fast-forward button, and that's what's going on here. Now, there has been several successors on the throne. Neb has been gone for quite some time. Now, who is on the throne here in chapter 5 is not actually Neb's son. But when we read the text, it, it says that, that this, this person, his name is Belshazzar, that Belshazzar is Neb's son, but it's not really his biological son. That's terminology that was used back in that time for anyone that sat on the throne, that if someone had preceded them, that they were called their son. But I want you to understand a little bit of background here into what's actually going on. Because if you read your Bible, you can find out in 2 Kings chapter 25 exactly who Nebuchadnezzar's son was, who we call Neb. Neb's son was a, a guy called Awel Marduk. And Awel Marduk sat on the throne right after Neb did. But then he was assassinated by his brother-in-law. So very short reign. After that, his brother-in-law sat on the throne for a while, and then his brother-in-law had a son who sat on the throne, and then his son was assassinated by a man named Nab Nabonidus. Now, Nabonidus was related to Neb somehow by marriage, don't know exactly how, but he was not a direct son in the lineage from Neb at all. He didn't like sitting on the throne in Babylon. Nabonidus was an outdoorsman. He, he was a warrior, and so he always wanted to be out fighting battles, hunting, fishing. Uh, they called him a frontiers man in history. So he's out on the frontier, and he decides, I don't want to be stuck to this throne, sitting behind the walls here in Babylon. And so he names his son to sit in kind of on the throne in his place to be the ruler while he's out doing what he wants to do. That person is Belshazzar who we're going to meet in chapter 5 today. So that means that Nabonidus was number 1, that Belshazzar was number 2, and that's significant because when we read chapter 5 today and he's offering some rewards, Belshazzar is, he's saying, you could be third in the kingdom. Well, that's because Nabonidus was 1, Belshazzar was 2, and whoever else could be 3. So we need to understand that. There's something even more that you need to understand about what's going on in history at this time, right here when we're entering into chapter 5. First of all, you need to understand that Babylon was a fortified city. It was known that you couldn't get in it. That's why it had lasted for so long as a kingdom. Some scholars believe the walls of Babylon were 250 to 300 feet high. Can you imagine that? That's really, really, really high. These were fortified walls that could not be knocked over. They were really, really thick walls. They, they were impenetrable by all of the outside forces. The other things that they had done really wisely as they were building the city of Babylon is they actually had farmland inside the city gates. And so they always were growing food. They had all the food that they needed. The other thing that was interesting is they always had a great water supply because they built Babylon over the Euphrates River. 
And if you know your, your geography, some of you do, your geography buffs, you know that it was the Tigris and the Euphrates. They had actually built the city of Babylon over the Euphrates River. So the Euphrates River was actually flowing through the city gates right into the town. I mean, this place was, was, was fortified. It was great. It was impenetrable. But what was going on at this time when we go into chapter 5 is that that city had been surrounded by the Medo-Persians. Now, that's significant if you can remember back because in Daniel chapter 2, do you remember the statue? If you remember the statue from Daniel 2 from week 2 of this series, and you remember that it, that it was Babylon was the head of gold, and then there was the neck of silver, which was the Medo-Persian Empire. Well, they're right outside these fortified city walls, and the people are scared. I mean, they're, they're kind of like, man, these people are camped out like right outside our door. But Belshazzar's feeling, he's feeling fine. He's like, we need, we need to chill out here. We, we, we've got the city fortified. They, there's no way that they can come in. Uh, they're, they're not going to get to us. And so uh, we're, we're going to do it fine. We need to cheer this thing up. And that is where we pick up the context here in chapter 5 today. One more little tidbit. At this time, Daniel has been forgotten. Daniel's kind of been, you know, on the shelf. He's kind of dusty. Uh, you know, not much has been happening. And so it's really interesting when you get to the text today that, that this, this, this guy from the past, you know, he's from, you know, like years ago. He's actually brought out and dusted off here in chapter 5, and God uses him in an amazing way. So let's read the text together, uh, Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for for a thousand of his nobles, and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Okay, so you, you, I just can't let this pass. you got to catch this, okay? He's throwing a kegger, and he's using things from God's holy temple from Jerusalem. And understand, folks, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's trying to pump up the crowd and get it positive. I know we're surrounded, but we're going to be fine. And look, there was this God in Israel. There's supposed to be some great God. We're going to use his fine china and have us a great time together. That's where we're at. Verse 3. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the little g-gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. Now, you need to understand, it's significant that it's near the lampstand in the royal palace. It was so everyone could see. Can you imagine a light that's on a wall and it just lights up a wall and here comes this hand writing on the wall? Yeah, that's... So it says, the king watched the hand as it wrote. Verse 6, his face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. So what should he do? It was just writing on the wall. The king summoned the enchanters, the astrologers, and the diviners. Have we... Have we seen this before? Um, then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And we know why they're third highest, right? Nabonidus, Belshazzar, third highest. Then all the king's men came in. They could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified. His face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. And then in verse 10, it says, the queen, and if you have a study Bible or study note, you can look down there. It says, uh, could be the queen mother. They don't know exactly who this is. Could have been, you know, the queen mother. But, but the queen, the queen mother, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. <laughs> it's not something you want to say in front of everyone, but that's okay. That's okay. She meant well. Uh, there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Neb, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because, here's his name, Daniel, 
whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what this writing means. So here you go. Dust him off. You know, here comes Daniel, almost 70 years old, years of wisdom. Here we go, verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles? My father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight and intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and to tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you'll be clothed in purple, you'll have a gold chain placed around your neck, and... You will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Now look at Daniel's response, verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. And here goes Daniel doing his thing, his God thing. Once again, verse 18. Your majesty, the most high God. Now notice how he addresses the God of Israel. He's bringing it back, right? We talked about this last week. We've, we've seen this in, in chapters 1 through 4. Your majesty, the most high God, the real one, big G God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and all the peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those that he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. And when his heart became arrogant and hardened with what? Pride. He was deposed from his royal throne, stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people, given the mind of an animal. He lived like the wild donkeys, ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sits over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank from them. You praised the gods of, of silver and of gold and of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life in all of your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. And this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. And he says that twice. Everybody say, oh no. <laughs> Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Not good. Perez, your kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes and Persians. Now remember, Daniel chapter 2, why this is significant. Okay, the Medes and Persians that are right outside the city walls. Okay, then it says, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, gold chain placed around his neck. He was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And that very night... Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the king at the age of 62. You want to know how the Medes and Persians did it? They, it's, it's in history. They actually backed up the Euphrates River and rerouted it till that riverbed got really low and dry, and there wasn't this current going through the city. Went underneath the walls, came in, and killed Belshazzar that night. Several truths from the text I want to share with you today. The first one is this. Don't ever provoke and disrespect God. Amen. I just would, would just put it out there for your safety and well-being. Don't provoke and disrespect and taunt God Almighty. Amen. Okay, Belshazzar knew exactly what he was doing when he pulled out the temple the temple stuff, the, the gold goblets and, and, and all of those ornate, 
holy things. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was trying to pump up the crowd. All the nobles in the city were gathered there, you know, having this drink fest. And he, he was sending a message. It doesn't matter who it is. We're greater. We're more powerful. We're better. We call the shots. And this God of Israel doesn't. And look, we can just take this stuff out of their temple and use it however we want. And it was highly disrespectful to God. He's poking fun at the most high God, the God of the Jews. And I read that text and I'm like, man, he forgot the fear of the Lord. And then I think about today. Where's the fear of the Lord? Where is the fear of the Lord today? Do we forget that God is a God of justice? Do we forget that the Bible says that God will judge everyone someday? Don't ever provoke and disrespect God. Second truth from the text this morning. You don't find truth and you don't discern reality apart from God Almighty. Okay, you do not find truth. You do not discern reality apart from God Almighty. We've seen this pattern throughout Daniel. When, when Neb had a dream, chapter 2, he calls the enchanters and the diviners and the sorcerers and the magicians, calls them in to interpret the dream. Can they do it? No. Who does he call in? God man. God man Daniel. Daniel comes in, interprets the dream, right? Then we get to Daniel chapter 4. Happens again. Has a dream. Okay, come in, interpret the dream. Tell me what this dream means. Again, they can't do it. Again, he comes to Daniel. And here we are in chapter 5, and the same thing happens again. And it's a good reminder for us. If we want to know what God is up to, if we want to know the truth, if we want to discern reality, we do not turn to darkness for that. We do not turn to anything but God himself. We don't turn to the occult. We don't turn to horoscopes. We don't turn to palm reading. We don't turn into any of that stuff. Those kind of things, those are the things that you are dabbling in darkness and you're opening a door to darkness in your life and in your heart. And we've seen over and over again, just here in the book of Daniel, but over and over again in the Bible, that those things never lead to anything good. You're not going to find the truth from the father of lies. Doesn't that make sense? Why would you go to the father of lies, who is like the chief liar of all time, for truth? And yet so many people do. You want to find out what God is doing, you go to God. Because here's the truth. Truth is not from us, and it will never change. Truth is not from us. It's not, we, we, didn't, we didn't decide the truth. It is not from us, and it will never change. There is absolute truth in the world that never, ever changes. It doesn't matter what the culture says. Babylon says truth is relative, right? Truth, is, truth can change. Truth can change. I mean, this is the way of the world today. You know how it is. Well, there's no absolute truth. You, you, you have your truth and what you believe, and I have my truth and what I believe. And, and they've even gone a step further now because they're like, oh, that's your truth. But my truth, like, like what? We're the truth makers here? I mean, come on, folks. There is absolute truth. It comes from God Almighty. We need to be looking to God and his word for the source of truth. And all the things we try to make up and make work and try to stick our square pegs in a round hole, it does not work. We can pretend like it works. We can celebrate like it works. We can, we can think that, oh, yeah, yeah, truth is relative, but it isn't. There are absolute truths in this world. But Babylon says, hey, there isn't. That's why I think so many times, if we're honest, we have a lordship problem. We think we are the most high, <laughs> and we're not. God is the most high. Mankind does not define the truth. Popular opinion in the culture does not define the truth. Taking a poll does not define and tell you what the truth is. Mankind does not define the truth. Truth, they say, in the world today is relative. It can be different. Babylon doesn't respect the truth. It tries to twist it and distort it. it tries to set up truth on its own terms. We've got to remember, if you want to know the truth... In reality, you cannot do that apart from God Almighty. Third truth from the text today. I am where I am when I am for a planned purpose of God. I am where I am and when I am for a planned purpose of God. Remember that, Christians. And remember that God is sovereign over all. What happened in our text, verses 10 through 12? Queen Mother comes in. Isn't this interesting? He calls the enchanters and the diviners says, here, interpret the writing on the wall. And they say, oh, we can't. 
And then it's Queen Mother that's like, aha, she was where she was, when she was, for a divine purpose of God. And that was to tell Belshazzar, hey, go, go back to Daniel, this man named Daniel. Daniel thir- in Daniel 5, 13 through 17, the next part, right after the Queen Mother says that, what does Belshazzar do? Calls Daniel. Remember, Daniel's been shelved. He's been out of the picture for, for a few decades now. He dusts him off and brings him in. And I'm sure there may have been some point where Daniel's like, man, why am I still here? Why are we still here? Why are we not heading back to Jerusalem? What is God doing? And it's kind of these years of silence and there's not much going on. And, and yet Daniel is the one that needs to understand you are here for such a time as this. People had forgotten about Daniel, but God did not forget about Daniel. And once again, Daniel serves God in Babylon, and Daniel serves Babylon for God. Don't forget that. And some of you, I know, you, you may have heard this story before. Some of you may be hearing this story for the first time. But do you remember lines that you've maybe heard in your life, like, your days are numbered, or the writings on the wall? Folks, that came right here from Daniel chapter 5, so now you can source it. And you may think, because as you're reading this text, you're like, wait a second, wait a second. I feel like God is really impatient with Bell. I mean, with Neb, we got four chapters of God, you know, being really patient with Nebuchadnezzar, really patient. Okay, chapter four, he gets into a, a might bit of trouble, but God restores his kingdom. And, 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 and so why, why does Nebuchadnezzar get all these second chances with God? And then you get to Belshazzar, and, and there's no second chance here. But you need to understand something and think about it. It makes sense. After all we've read the last several weeks, Neb had an ignorance problem, but Belshazzar had an obedience problem because the text says that Belshazzar knew better. Did you catch that? Let's go back to it. Go back to verse 18. When he's addressing Belshazzar, Daniel says, Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor over all. And then in 19, 20, and 21, he talks about that. You get down to the end of 21, and he says, The most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Now look at verse 22. Then Daniel says, But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Don't miss it. He knew better. You knew all. All of this. You had history. You had the written word. You had the queen mother reminding you of your history lessons when you were a child. You knew all of this, and yet you chose to disobey God anyway. You ignored the mouth of God, so now you get the hand of God. God always warns, though, before he judges. I find this pattern in Scripture that God's going to give you a warning shot. Sometimes it's through a prophet. Sometimes it's through someone like Daniel. Sometimes it's through divine revelation. Sometimes it's through your prayer time. But God warns people before he judges them. But here's the problem. In this text in Daniel 5 is Babylon ignored God and said, I don't want anything to do with you. Does that sound like the United States maybe today? I'm just going to ignore you. I don't want anything to do with you. Shelve you. We'll, we'll dust you off maybe. Maybe someday in the future. Probably not, but maybe. You know, here's the fourth truth from the text today. God holds us accountable for what we know. God holds us accountable for what we know. This is part of Christianity we don't like, right? It's the accountability part. The changed life part. The allowing God and Jesus Christ to lead us and lead our hearts and lead our minds to holiness, to righteousness, and peace in Christ Jesus' power. Look what it says, though, in Romans 1, 18 through 20. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's what's happening in our culture today, folks. That's what's happening in our Babylon today. Suppressing truth by their wickedness. Okay, verse 19. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature that he has created, have, have clearly been seen, being understood from what has been made, his creation, his creation in the world, so that people are without excuse. 
that when you go out and you look at the stars, you look at nature, and you look at man made in God's image, and you look at the systems and how the world works and all the systems of the world, most people are like, man, who, who made this? Who, who created this? Then it always brings us back to this question of authority in the cosmos. And here in Romans chapter 1, it says, hey, everyone knows about God from that stuff. So I just want to tell you this, that on Judgment Day, it is not a great plan to plead ignorance. Not a good strategy, okay? That's why Christians, we plead what? The blood of Jesus. Because he covers all of our, all of our sin, all of our shortcomings. He covers it all through his sacrifice. Babylon doesn't have an ignorance problem at this point in Daniel. Babylon has an obedience problem. And I wonder sometimes if this isn't part of our story and our problem as we live in Babylon today. That year after year after year after year after year after year in Babylon, that we get really casual about our faith and our obedience to God. We get get really casual about knowing the Bible. We get kind of sloppy. We are people that, that, that begin to struggle with the commands of God. Well, did he really mean that? Well, is that really what it means? And, and, and you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to bring that into today. But folks, I want you to understand this. Don't interpret slow justice with no justice. Okay, 2 Peter 3.9 speaks to this. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. It's talking about the last days. It's talking about the return of Christ in the end times. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, what is God doing? He is patient with you. He doesn't want any of his children to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance in him. Do you remember from week two, the statue? The future does not belong to the statue. It belongs to who? The rock. Christ Jesus. Another truth from the text. When you live in Babylon, Babylon will try to get you to party with sacred things. When you live in Babylon, Babylon will try to get you to party with sacred things. And I'm here to tell you, don't do it. That party will always be crashed. The truth of God will endure, and Babylon doesn't care about the holy and sacred things of God. Our culture does not care about the sacred things of God. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. What about life? What, 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 is, what is sacred to God? What about life? The Bible says that God is the author, the perfecter, the sustainer of life. He's the creator of life. Life and lifeblood, if you're reading the Bible with us in the app, Uh, this year, man, you know, God has a lot in there about blood and about life, right? Because he says, this is important to me. Life in the womb, when life begins in the womb, that is important to me. That is a life. A life of a prisoner that's committed a horrific crime in prison. That life matters to me. Life is sacred. That life of that junkie that's out on the streets this morning, that's shooting it up, that's committing crimes, that life is God says it's sacred to me. I am a God of life. Now, what does the culture say? Life in the womb doesn't matter. We'll call it birth control instead of murder. We'll kill it. We'll be in charge of when we take life or not. We'll throw the ones that we think are the outcasts of society, leave them out in the streets. In fact, in some countries of the world, maybe a little more uncivilized than us, they kill people for population control. There's euthanasia happening all over the world. And yet God says life is sacred. But the culture said, no, it's not. No, it's not. Crime on the rise, murders on the rise everywhere right now. What's something else that God says is sacred? Marriage. Marriage is his idea. It's from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. It's Adam and Eve. And yet what do we do with the sacred things of God? What does the culture do? No, that's not sacred. That's not sacred. No, it could be a man and a man, a woman and a woman, a man and a fish. A dolphin and a turkey and a woman. I mean, whatever. It's a free-for-all, whatever goes. We think we know best. We know just biologically it doesn't make sense, but that's okay. It doesn't make sense biologically because God is old and he's out of touch. He doesn't know what he's doing. And the culture says taking the sacred things of God and saying no. So there's life and then there's marriage and then there's our bodies. The Bible says our body is the holy is, is a temple of the Holy Spirit of God, that God's Holy Spirit resides in us when we become a Christian. 
God's Holy Spirit is in us. And yet, what do we do? What do we do to our bodies so many times? What do we do to these, these temples? Remember that we're made in the image of God, the Bible says. We mutilate it, we alter it, we don't like it. And what about another thing? What about God's name? God says, my name is sacred. My name is holy. My name is set apart. Ten Commandments. Do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. And what do we see everywhere today? OMG. Everywhere. Oh, we're in this OMG world and OMG this and OMG that. Folks, use my name in vain. Use, use someone else's name in vain. Do not use the Lord's name in vain. I think it is a slippery, slippery slope of disrespect, and I feel almost like we're taunting God. Now, do you feel like in any way that our Babylon today might be under some judgment because we have taken the holy and sacred things of God and said, huh, I don't care. We'll do life on our terms. You see, Babylon doesn't care about those things. Last thing this morning. Faithfulness will be recognized and rewarded. Remember that faithfulness to God will be recognized and rewarded. Sometimes in this world, but how about forever in heaven? You see, true honor isn't determined by kings. True honor is determined by God himself. And I hate it when I see that people will forfeit everlasting rewards for temporary feel-goods. Don't sell out your life in that way. Stay close to God. Keep fighting Babylon. I want to share a story to end this morning about a guy named Cliff Young. You may have heard his story before, and there'll be some pictures um, on the screen about him. The year was 1983. And Cliff was 61 years old. And in Australia, they were running something called an ultra marathon from Sydney to Melbourne, Australia, 544 miles. That would be like going from Enid, Oklahoma to Keosauqua, Iowa, southeast corner of Iowa, my, my, my hometown area where I'm from. 544 miles. And they run this thing in five to six days. The pattern was that they would run for 18 hours and rest for six. And everyone who ran this race was under 30, super well-trained athletes. They all had sponsors, they all had shoes. And here's this guy, Cliff Young, that heard about the race. He comes and shows up in his overalls and these boot galosh things. And he decides he's going to run the race. Now, they asked him because he shows up. He doesn't look like anyone else running in the race. Are you going to run in this thing? You know, what, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I heard about it. He's like, I'm, I'm a farmer and, and I, I, I grow potatoes, but I also chase sheep and goats and cows out in the pastures. And I just thought, man, I, I, sometimes I do that when it's raining and pouring. I do that for three, four days. Don't take a break. And I just thought, man, I, I could run this race. And so he sets out to run the race. Now, he gets made fun of along the way. He actually has this gait, this shuffle that he does. And he's, you know, falling behind at the beginning of the race. But you remember the pattern for those ultra marathoners is 18 and 6, 18 hours of running. And they run. They run for 18 hours. And they rest for 6. But not Cliff Young. Cliff Young runs all day, every day, and doesn't stop. Maybe takes a small break here or there, grab a drink of water, grab something to eat, and heads on out. Because that's what he did. He just ran around the fields chasing the animals. He didn't know any better. You get to the finish line of the race, and Cliff finished nine hours before the first ultra marathon runner. And when asked by an interviewer, how did you do it? Do you know what he said? Even when it was dark, I just kept running. Here's the deal, folks. How did Daniel make it? How did Daniel become so effective for the kingdom? Daniel kept running even when it was dark. Now, I know that some of us feel like, man, we're there. In our world, in our culture, we're there. It is dark. Folks, keep on running toward God. 
Keep on running toward God. Keep, keep on keeping the commands of God. Keep pursuing holiness and righteousness and truth in, in your life. And I know it's not on your own power. I get it. It's only because of Jesus. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our strength. That's why the Apostle Paul says things like, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because when I am weak, the power of God wells up in me. And he also said, follow me as I follow Christ. How can a guy say that? It's because he was walking with Jesus and he didn't care what was going on in the world. He says, I'm going to continue to run through the darkness toward God. And that's the call of God for all of us this morning. If you are outside of faith in Jesus Christ, you need to deed your life over to him and don't waste another day without him. Some of you today are saying, hey, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been running my race well. And as the darkness has crept in, I've allowed some darkness in my life. I'm here to tell you this morning, repent of your sins. Turn back toward God. And run your race with him through the darkness. Because with his strength and his power, you too can live a godly life. And that's what God has called us to do for his kingdom.